All right, and take your Bibles, please, and open to the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. We'll look at verses 19 and 20. Matthew, chapter 18, 19 and 20. Jesus said, again, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth, you shall be bound in heaven. I'm reading verse 18, I'm sorry, it's verse 19. Let's start over. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. May the Lord bless the reading of his inerrant and infallible holy word. Again, the question of the hour is, what must we do in our church in order to have a revival? Here's an answer. We must call on God through prayer. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And again, in verse 20, I just read a moment ago, uh, Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It is absolutely imperative that we call on him who is able to pour his power upon us. It is definitely possible for us to have a revival if we will call on God through prayer. And prayer is a prerequisite to revival. I stand here to say that if we won't, if we really, truly won't, a Pentecostal type experience in this church, in this place, then we must all be praying for this revival. Listen as I ask three questions in regards to calling upon God in prayer. First of all, the the first question is why? Why must we call on God through prayer? And here's an answer to that. That is, he's the power source. He's the source of power that we need to be connected to if we are going to have a spiritual awakening. He's the power source. Now, Jesus said before he ascended to go to heaven to be with his father, he gave the great commission, and here's what he said in Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost, that is the, the Holy Spirit, comes upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what Jesus said. So that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it happened for those followers of Christ on the day of Pentecost, when they were in that upper room, they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, that was then, this is now, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit for us now is not something that happens after we get saved, It is what happens instantaneously when we get saved. When we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are baptized in the Spirit. In Ephesians 4, 5, it says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It happens when we get saved. It was different then because uh, this was uh, the Holy Spirit coming from Jesus out of heaven unto the church to ignite them, to literally set them on fire for the Lord and and to, to fill them up with his spirit. He baptized them there in that upper room. And and but now for us it happens at the moment of conversion. That being said, let me tell you that we all, as Christians, are like a nice, big, beautiful, brand new, spanking brand new, right off the lot, automobile. Whatever car you want to, you you prefer or whatever, just imagine yourself like that car that just comes off the lot and it smells new, it looks new, because it is new. Suppose they, I don't know what they do when you buy a new car, I haven't bought a new car in many years, 
but suppose they fill up your tank of gas. Just suppose they do, and you drive off, and you've got a tank full of gas, and you're driving down the road, and everything's going so good and all, and then you, uh, all of a sudden, you, the gas tank starts to get low, you pull into your driveway, and you run out of gas just as you pull in the driveway, and, and, and all your friends, all your family, you say, look at my new car. Look, it's a beautiful car, but with no gas in that car, it's, it's really worthless. It's just sitting there. It has no use. You've got to fill it up with gas. So with that in mind, let me tell you that we might be the best-dressed Christian that comes to this revival services. We might be the most talented we might be the most educated. We might have the most money. We might think that we are it. And we come to this revival and we show up in front of everyone else and we think, oh, I'm standing tall above all other people in this church. I'm something good. I'm something special. Look, at the moment of conversion, we were all baptized with the Spirit. But then as life goes on, we must every day be filled with the Spirit. The baptism and the infilling are two different things, see. We're always baptized. That cannot be taken away from us. But the infilling of the Spirit, that's something we must do every day. And we must not let our spiritual tanks get low and run on empty. Because if we let the Holy Spirit in our spiritual tank get empty then no matter how much education we got, no matter how many talents we have, no matter how much money we may possess, no matter who we are, we are worthless if we have no spirit in us to do the things that God wants us to do. If we want a real spiritual awakening, a real revival in this place, then what we need to do is to have God to fill us up with his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is our power. We need to be filled up with the power of God. I tell you that it's vitally important that we do that. Now, these Christians who were endowed with the power of God on the day of Pentecost in that upper room by the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit baptism. What were they doing right prior to being baptized with the Spirit? They were praying. In Acts 1.14, it says, These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. They were praying. So, if we want the Holy Spirit to come in us, and fill us with his power, then what must we do in order for that to happen? We must call on God through prayer. Amen. Does everyone understand this? Amen. We need to be praying for the Holy Spirit to come in us and fill us up. Now, I read something about a father. That little boy was playing in the backyard in his sandbox. And maybe it was an older sibling or something, some, uh, someone put a big old rock in his sandbox and it took up half the sandbox. And little boy, he's a little small fella, and he's trying his earnest best to pick up that rock and get it out of his sandbox. But he's little and he couldn't move the rock. He tried all he could. He's trying, he's budging, he's pushing. And dad was looking out the window the whole time watching his little boy trying to pick up and move that rock, which is way too heavy for him. So dad goes out there, and he walks up to the little boy at the sandbox, and he says to him, son, I see you're trying to move that big rock out of that sandbox. Have you done everything you possibly can do to remove that rock? Little boy looked up at his daddy and said, yes, daddy, I've done all I can do. The daddy said, no, you haven't. You haven't asked your father to help you. Look, we may do all that we can to have revival. We may make revival flyers like this and pass them out. We may secure the speakers and the singers and make arrangements. We may plan the dates on the calendar. 
We may show up at the meetings. The question will be, have we done all that we possibly can do to bring revival to this church? And we might say, yeah, I made the flyers, passed them out, printed the bulletin, secured the speakers and the dates, everything's all lined up, done all that we can do. No, that's not all we can do. The question is, have we called upon God through prayer? Have we called our Father? He's the only one who can bring us revival. He's the only one who can truly help us have a spiritual awakening. The question is, have we called on the Father? Now I will tell you this. A second reason why we must call on God through prayer is because he's the forgiver of sins that can cleanse us from, uh, that can give us a spiritual cleansing. Now, it tells us in Colossians 1, 14, it says, In Christ Jesus we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, blood doesn't clean things. I mean, blood is, is, um, our, is, is what we have to have to live. But if you have a cut on your hand or something and, and you're bleeding, blood can stain. It's, it's something that's hard to clean up and you know, and, and so you say, how could blood cleanse anything? The blood of Christ cleanses everything. Amen. The blood of Christ, that is, if we ask it to apply to us, the blood of Christ can make us whole and clean, white as snow. Now, Jesus cleansed the temple one time because there was sin in the temple. We, we know that. And for us to have a true revival, look, Let me tell you something. Not only must we need Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit to fill us all up individually and as a church as a whole to empower us, we need Jesus by way of his Holy Spirit to cleanse us. The church, a prerequisite to revival, the church needs a spiritual cleansing. You might say, no, I don't agree with that, Pastor. I, I, I don't agree with you. I'm not on the same page with you. Hang with me. Every one of us individually need a spiritual cleansing. Every one of us. The Bible is very distinct and clear on this and says that all of us are sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. Look it up in Romans chapter 3. Now, There are sins in the church. What kind of sins? Well, there's the sin of pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I looked at that word haughty, and the word means arrogant. I looked at the word arrogant, and the word means someone who's self-absorbed or someone who is self-centered. There's a lot of that in the church. It's what I call an eye disease. We need, we need help with this I problem. I this, I that, it's all about us. And, and that's a problem, that's pride. We need to be, the opposite of, of pride is to be humble. We need to be a people that are humble. So we need to ask God to cleanse us of all pride and arrogance and self-centeredness that we may have. Another sin in the church is indifference. Oh, it might be that we, that we don't care. It might be that there are some among us, believe it or not, that could care less whether we have a, a spiritual awakening or not. It might be that some would say, I don't care uh, about the singers that are coming that Sunday morning. I don't care about the speakers who will speak. I don't care that, uh, I, that there's a meeting going on. I've got other things that I'm interested in and I want to do. If any of us have an indifferent, apathetic attitude making us become a lackadaisical people, then we are going to have, we're going to have to be accounted for that unto God. And we need to ask God to cleanse us of that attitude. But that is a sin in the church. Irreverence for God is another sin. I've stood behind this pulpit many times, folks, and I've said, that I believe that the church has lost its fear of God. 
uh, that once upon a time, I know it's before this era and the day of computers and, and uh, television and, and sporting events and other events that take place on the Lord's Day. There's a lot of allurements, a lot of things, that, a lot of bait that the devil as a fisher of our souls tries to put in front of us to draw us away from the church on Sunday. Once upon a time on Sunday, everyone went to church. The Lord's house would be filled. Not only this church, but every church, folks. The church house would be filled. And now, it's hard to, to get people to come. Because so many folks have an irreverence to God. They've lost their fear, their respect to the Lord. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, now Israel. Say, well, it's for them, not us. No, no, no. Israel is God's people. We are God's people now. As it's historically written for them, it is spiritually applicable to us. And it says, now Israel, take that word Israel out, put church, because it's for us too. And now church, what doth the Lord thy God require thee but to fear the Lord thy God? We need to ask God to cleanse us of this lack of respect and fear of God. Another sin in the church is just simply immoral living. Oh, no. No, 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 pastor, no. You, again, you're preaching to the choir. There's no, look, none of us are perfect. And, and sin is sin, no matter how big or how small in the eyes of God. And sin is immorality. And we must ask God to forgive us of our sins. We need to ask God, as David did, to create in our hearts uh, a new heart to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So Jesus is the, the one who can come by way of his Holy Spirit and give us this spiritual cleansing, and that's why we must call on God through prayer. Now I go to the next question. The next question is when? When must we call on God through prayer for revival? When must we do it? When we are in the deep valley, what do I mean by that? When we are in trouble, when we are hurting, when we are afraid, when we are struggling, when we are in the midst of storms, hardships, trials, tribulations, pain, difficulty, do we all sometimes go through those kind of things in our lives? Certainly we do. All of us, because we're human. There are times we get way down in the valley. And we may feel like we're so depressed and so discouraged. And God, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to get myself out of this. God, I just feel like giving up. I feel like quitting. That's what the devil wants us to do. God doesn't like quitters. God wants us to hang on. When we're in the deep valleys of life, and, we, and pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm going through in my life. Don't preach to me. No, maybe I don't know what you're going through. But God does, and God cares. Amen. And when we're struggling, we're hurting, we need to call on him through prayer. Uh, uh, this is what it says in one of the Psalms. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And I'm sure Paul knew about that verse, because I think about Paul and Silas when they were in prison in Philippi. You know what? They were laying on their backs in that cold, dark dungeon with their feet up in stocks, knowing that they're going to be killed for the cause of Christ. They're going to be murdered, brutally killed. And so what does it say they did? At midnight, you find this in Acts 16, 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. They prayed when they were in the deep valley. They prayed when we're in the deep valley. We must call upon the Lord. Now, there was this one man who prayed one time, he said, Dear God, 
Was it you? It wasn't me. But someone prayed this prayer. They said, Dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been nasty or selfish. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed and I'm going to really need your help. A lady was driving down the road, a hurricane, I mean, no, a tornado, I should say, rather, a tornado was coming, and she pulls out the side of the road and gets into a ditch. And the tornado just literally obliterated and destroyed a home. After it passed over, she gets out and runs to that home to see if there's anyone, any survivors, anyone around. And she sees a man crawling out of a hole that was in the ground. And he was okay. And she looked at him. She said, sir, are you all right? He said, yes, I am. She said, is there anyone else down there in that hole with you? And he said, no, just me and God having an urgent conversation. When the storms come our way, sometimes we, we must have an urgent conversation with the Lord. An urgent conversation. And that's when we really need God. When our church, if the church is struggling, if the church is hurting, and the church is going through hard times, and by the way, it starts with us all individually, and if there's one or two or three or four individuals that are struggling, it can have an effect on the whole congregation. And when the church is hurting and the church is struggling, when the church is going through a hard time, then we, the people of the church, need to call on God through prayer. He can help us overcome these obstacles in our life. A second time when we must call on the Lord, on God through prayer, is when we're on the high mountain. Now, what do I mean by that? When times are going good. Unfortunately, many of us, the only time we ever call upon God, Many of us, the only time we ever call upon God is when we're going through the storms and the trials and the afflictions. Have we not ever thought for one minute that maybe God in heaven is thinking, I wish my children would call me sometimes during the good days, during the good times, and not just when they need me. Not just when they're hurting. Not just when they need some divine intervention. We should call on me during good times every once in a while. Now, Jesus healed some lepers one time, 10 lepers, and we find this in Luke 17. In Luke 17, 13, it says they, they cried with a loud voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus healed them, all 10 of them. And it says in verse 18, there, there was found no one that came back to give glory unto God save this one who was a stranger. He was called a stranger because he's a Samaritan. He's the only one that came back and gave Jesus thanks. It's a very sad thing, but I regretfully say it's a true thing that so many of us in the Lord's house, in the church, only praise God when we are in church, but not at home and not in other places. We only call on God when we need him. And we don't call on him just to say, God, I love you. God, I want to praise you. I want to honor your holy name. Going down the road, we should sing praises unto God. Driving the the lawnmower in the backyard, mowing the grass, we should sing praises unto God. Walking down the road, we should pray unto him and say, God, I love you and I praise you and I honor you and I thank you for who you are. So we should call on God through prayer during the good times. And I would say as a whole, our church is not perfect. But within this last year, our church has been blessed by God and some good things have been happening. We must not get complacent and overlook it. We must not just go through the motions and ignore it and not realize it. We need to look and see what God's been doing for us and give him honor, glory, and praise and adoration and say, God, I just love you and I want to call upon you right now and during the good times, not just during the hard times. A third time when we should call on him is when we're stuck in the mud. 
What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is this. You know, sometimes you'll have a car, as I said, may run out of gas, maybe as an engine problem, and it gets stalled. Many of us, like churches and like Christians, are like stalled cars going nowhere. We're stuck. We're going nowhere. We're making no progress. And that's when we need to pray. When we feel like we're not advancing in life and we're not maturing, we're not growing, we're not getting any closer. If we feel like, look, I preached my heart out over the last several weeks, and, I, and if we say, I just don't feel it. I, I don't feel the fire burning within me. I don't feel it. If that's the case, then we're stuck in the mud. We're stuck. And that's when we need to have a prayer meeting. When's it going to be? Wednesday night at 6.30? Yes, everyone come Wednesday night at 6.30. That's when we pray. But when I, I'm, what I'm talking about here, folks, is this. Uh, we need to call a prayer meeting. That means individually, like Gypsy Smith said, draw the circle around us and start within that circle and start praying. That's where it starts. And again... Jesus said, I send to you where two of you are gathered or uh, will believe and trust in on God intervening. I know I'm not getting that right. Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth, it's touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for you. For them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. David said in Psalm 51, 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. If we feel like we're stuck, if we feel like we're going nowhere, if we feel like we're not warming up to the, uh, the, the presence of God, if we feel like we're just stuck, we need to call a prayer meeting. Maybe we, maybe we feel lukewarm. We, we feel like, I just, just don't have it. I don't have that passion. Then we're stuck. And we need to pray to God and say, God, send your spirit into my heart, into my soul. Ignite me. Move me, God. Move me. Make something happen in my life. Help me to get out of this mud and help me to start going the direction you want me to go and be the person you want me to be. Bring revival to my heart. A bad apple and a bowl of apples can make all the other apples go bad. A good apple is what needs to be put into that bowl to help the other apples stay fresh. We need to ask God to help us all to be filled by His Spirit so we can have a positive influence and effect on one another. Look, we need to be praying for God to come down to this place. And we need to be praying unto him to help us, even if we're in the deep valley, on the high mountain, or stuck in the mud, wherever we are in our life, we need to pray to God to bring us revival. And it starts with us individually in the circle. Again, the Gypsy Smith suggested we draw around us. But not only should we pray for ourselves, we should pray for one another. That's intercessory prayer. I need to be praying for all of you to be revived. You need to be praying for me to be revived. We need to be praying for the ones to the left of us and the right of us, in front of us and the back of us in this church to be revived. We need to be praying for that. We must not have the attitude of, God bless me and my wife, my son and his wife, us four and no more. No, we need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying for God to come down into this church. That brings me now to the third question, and that is how. We've looked at why, when, now how. How must we call on God through prayer? Number one, through humble submission. That revival verse, I call it the revival verse, Second Chronicles 7.14. The writer there said, if my people, and it's God talking, but if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Humble submission. We need to, all of us, get on our knees, figuratively speaking, because some of us may not be able to get on our knees, but whatever posture of prayer, that's irrelevant to God. He doesn't care how we pray, as long as we pray. But we need to pray unto him to do something big in this church, and we must do it humbly. We must do it in humility. That is a prerequisite to revival. Then through persistent pleading, I hope you've been praying every day. Every single day when I go walking outside, I pray to the Lord. I pray for my family, my church family, and I've been praying for revival every day, and we should. And we must never quit. We must never stop. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says we should pray without ceasing. Luke 18.1 says men ought always to pray. You remember the story about Daniel in the lion's den? What happened to him? He was praying three times a day. He prayed in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening every single day. Daniel prayed. And then what happened was Someone told the king that he's praying to another god, his god, and the king says, all right, and they persuaded the king to make some kind of law that if anyone prays to another god besides, and doesn't pray to him instead, they'll be thrown into the den of lions. And Daniel didn't care. He was going to do what he wanted to do, and that was to pray to God. So Daniel prayed anyway. Daniel would rather spend the night in a den of lions than to miss one night of prayer. And so many of us are so distracted in life with things that are going on all around us that we don't take time to pray. We must pray, 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 keep on praying. Jesus said in Acts 7, verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. You know what that verse is really telling us to do? Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. And don't quit. Persistent pleading is how we should call on God through prayer for revival. And then through mountain moving faith. Do we really believe do we really believe that in the second week of November that we can and will have a spiritual awakening in this church? Do we really believe it or not? I mean, come on. Amen. It's a reality check here right now. Do we believe it or not? Amen. There are mountains that the devil puts in front of us, such as the mountain of doubt. I don't believe it's possible. I don't believe it's possible. I don't think we can. Or it might be the mountain of distraction. There's so many things, Pastor Randy, that's going on in my life. So many things that I'm involved with. You don't know what's on my plate. I ain't got time for this. Or it might be that there are allurements that the devil is putting in front of us, distracting us and saying that I am enticing you to come and do this or that instead of going to church that week. Don't go. Instead, do what I say. And the devil paints a picture that we love to see. He puts things in front of our eyes that appeal to us. He's sneaky. He's smarter than we are. We have to be careful around the old red dragon. He knows what will make us fall. He knows exactly where to cast his bait. 
what will get us. He knows. The devil knows. So I tell you that we need to pray for God to move those mountains. There are big mountains. Big mountains. This is what Jesus said, Mark 11, 22 and 23. He said, have faith in God. For verily I say to you, and I, and I imagine in the backdrop there was probably a large hill. Jesus said, for verily I say to you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, this mountain of doubt, this mountain of distraction, this mountain of allurements, whatever it might be, it's in our life. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. See, the Sea of Galilee it was very, very low down below sea level. And hills were all around it. So he's seen, just imagine the backdrop. He says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into this sea. And shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that these things that he prays for shall come to pass and he shall have what he, he prays for, is what he said. So we must pray for God to move these mountains. And he can and he will. We must have a mountain size, a moving, mountain moving faith. Now, I come to that part where I conclude my sermon. Don't put your Bibles up quite yet. Just listen to me. There's a man one time who had a dream. He was walking down the road. And in that dream, he saw a church, kind of like this one. And he looked up and he saw a demon on the roof of that church, a devil. He goes on down a little bit, and there's an, a little small cottage, just a little house. There were hundreds and hundreds of demons on that roof, and they looked restless. They were moving around. They looked nervous. They looked agitated. By the way, that one devil's on top of the church roof was sleeping. Yeah, he's sleeping. So the man sees one of the demons running around and circles around that house, that, uh, the little small house, and he says to him, he said, what's going on? He said, uh, why, are there, why is there only one devil to sleep on top of the church roof, and, and yet this little house, there are hundreds of demons that are just panicking and going crazy, and the devil said, because over there in that church is a people who are just going through the motions Sunday after Sunday, and they're not praying. They're not believing. They don't have faith. So it only takes one devil, and he, they're so lifeless over there that he don't even have to stay awake. He's got it under control. But over, over here at this house, the little cottage, the little small house, where there are hundreds of demons, he said, there's a man and woman inside that house, and boy, they have communion with God. They pray to him, and they have faith. And he said, we've got all the demons we can to try to, to combat against that. That's just a story. But is that the way it is with us in our church? Is it where the devil only has to send one of his demons, or two, maybe three, and... He's got it under control. He's, we don't have the faith. We don't believe. We're not praying. We're not anticipating a movement of God. The devil doesn't need much. Or are we individually connecting with God and praying and believing with all our heart and we have the faith? Look, we need to get to the point to where the devil has to send hundreds of demons on the roof of this church. We need to, we need, it needs to be that way. Let's do a self-inventory right now, all of us. A self-inventory. Let's look at our lives. Where are we with God right now in regards to this revival? Where are we with God? Do we believe? Do we have faith? Are we praying? Prayer is a prerequisite to revival. If we really, really, really want a spiritual awakening to happen in this place, we need to call on God through prayer.
That's the way it is. God bless. Let us pray.